at some point with every GraphQL API, you're going to have to put your ops hat on and like make it way more observable, especially when it comes to like latency and stuff too. It may not be errors that gets you. Maybe like your P95 is like 30 seconds and uh, your whole app's about to crash, you know, because <laughs> you didn't observe on your resolvers to see what they were doing. No, that's a good point on P95. Like, again, if you just use like your typical observability solutions, you'll have like one dashboard slash GraphQL with a P99 yeah. on it. It literally means nothing, right? Unless things go horribly wrong, you'll see it. But if like one query is slow and one page keeps timing out, not sure at like a large scale enough, I'm not sure you'll see it on that slash GraphQL graph, right? So now you got to exactly. stop thinking in terms of endpoints and start thinking in queries. And that's all like custom tooling. So yeah, Max, as you said, we, we need GraphQL tools for sure. What's actually also interesting about the P95 response time specifically is that we actually looked at our data across the thousands of GraphQL APIs that use GraphCDN. And we realized that most people send between five to 10 GraphQL requests per page view which I did not expect at all, right? Now, there's obviously some extremes, right? Like there's the people that use Relay, which is a minority, but they exist. And they, most of the time, they send like one point whatever mm -hmm. requests per page on average because they usually just send one per page to load data. But most people don't use Relay and most people actually send somewhere between five, which blows my mind. I did not expect this. I was like, surely it's like one to two, right? But no, it's like five to 10. And that in turn means that actually people that look at even their P50 time or their P95 time, that time is pretty useless. Because if you have five to 10 requests per page, I forgot what the calculation is, but it's like 96% of your users are gonna experience a page load time that's slower than your right. P50 time. Right, And it's like the median P50 time, except everybody hits a time that's worse than the P50 time just because you're sending 5 to 10 graphical requests per page. You just have to assume that you're the person who hit the P99 that day and how pissed <laughs> you'd be. And then you'd be exactly. motivated to fix it, you know? Yep. Because, uh, you know, would you, wish, would you wish a P99 on your worst enemy? That's your request of question. <laughs> <right>? Yep, exactly. <laughs> so, how do you actually do observability on your federated graph at Netflix? Like, how do the developers get insights into their parts of the schema and how that part of the schema is performing? A lot of it is based just on, like, the amazing work that the teams have been doing there for years, right, for observability. So, like, the, um, tracing, I find, is just, like, so important, especially with GraphQL uh, and especially with Federation, just seeing what service called which service, response times between uh, services is really important. In general, though, I think for observability, thinking in terms of queries is super important. So if you're using things like persisted queries or persisted documents or whatever, observing those rather than your general GraphQL endpoint, I think is a fairly easy way to actually see what's going on. I'm not the biggest fan of per resolver observability, just because there's so many things that can go wrong there, like especially using data loader. Most GraphQL APIs use a data loader pattern, which like batches and kind of defers calls to underlying services or databases, which is usually the expensive part. So if you just observe resolver times, most of them will respond almost instantly, but they actually queued up something expensive to be executed later. So it's a bit tricky to um, observe resolvers themselves. So I think if you can, if you have a, a limited amount of queries that you have persisted, if you can actually have dashboards for those queries, they give you a, like a really good observability for not that much effort. And then of course, tracing, there's a ton of tracing products out there, but it's, uh, it's a great way to observe graphical queries too. And there's plugins for almost all GraphQL libraries too, um, which is amazing. And then I guess my next tip that I kind of touched upon is most of the time spent in GraphQL queries is spent calling external services or loading data from databases. And those are the important part you want to observe. Usually it's like, given this GraphQL query, like what actually happened? Oh, you made five SQL queries and five service calls. And usually the worst offenders are something that are N plus ones or a service call that's slow. So if you're to optimize for something, I'd optimize for having visibility into external calls that happened during a query. And tracing can be a shortcut for that usually. Yeah, tracing would be pretty good. Or also not writing all your logic within your resolvers, right? Like having like service layers. So you don't actually have to worry about GraphQL tooling actually. You just you just implement observability on like whatever classes you created to do some data access. That could help too. You know, you just get around the whole like resolver worry. That's a good point. Um, I want uh, you guys' thoughts on this. So I have nightmares about this. 
I'm a big fan of also having your, as you said, Avi, uh, having your domain logic, you know, like a nice service layer, unit tested, good OOP or functions, and then having a GraphQL layer call that. But then something I, I, I've realized over the years is that it's kind of in tension with the data loader pattern sometimes. Depending if you see data loaders as a GraphQL concept, or a domain concept. If you have this beautiful like function that you call to know, I don't know, if we take, um, if a product is available, for example, if there's inventory, in reality, in the GraphQL world, you'll need to data load that to batch calls, for example, hundreds of products. And usually people do that in a resolver, they batch that, but then you need to extract some of the data loading out of your service layer, or you need to push your data loader in your service context and always think in terms of like plurals, right? <laughs> like our products yeah. in the inventory. So that weird tension is makes it super annoying to try and have that isolated service layer. It also needs to be user aware, permission aware. So I so agree with you and I try to push that as far as I can, but in practice, there's it's really hard. I don't know if you've you felt the same pains before. Definitely felt the same pains, but you kind of have to live with the pain if your service layer serves a REST API as well, or you're doing the multi clients that are not GraphQL. I think what you what you end up having having is like you have like like execution contexts, right? Where you're like, okay, like I have this same function, but it's a data loader. I pass it into the data loader. I got this one for my express app and I got this one for internal calls within workers and stuff inside the same container. So man, there's just so many ways to skin all this stuff when it comes to like these kind of topics right here, which is, I guess is what DevOps people like really argue about more. And we're over here arguing about GraphQL JS and stuff. <laughs> <laughs>